The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. A lot of people are very unsure about America's future. Now, that's not a bad thing if you're saved, but for a large number of them, America is the only thing they have to look forward to. You know what? Each of you who have accepted Christ as your personal Savior should give that a few seconds of thought to know that there's a kingdom on its way that you may dwell in for eternity. But most of all, that your hopes are not bound to a landmass, to an idea established by men. All people want freedom. All of them do. But freedom in this world has a price, a price of which, with our Lord and his coming kingdom, has been paid not for the kingdom's sake, but so that you can get there. I thought that was a wonderful thing because that gives you promise beyond promise. Most people, the promise of a future is not so established anymore. There was a time when people would uh, talk about what they would do in the future and so forth, and they had big plans. When you speak to people these days, you don't really hear that. In fact, you hear them wanting to make some type of difference with what they have because the promise of tomorrow is very uncertain in their minds. They would like to do certain things, but it's just too unstable at the moment. We live in turbulent times, to be exact, very turbulent. The sad part is not one of them, or very few, spoke about the kingdom to come. And so that glimmer of hope in their eyes was not there because what they have to look forward to is bound to this earth in this reality. For them, they're not thinking about the kingdom of God. And you know, this is a hurdle or an obstacle that many of us have had to cross to take our thoughts and not have them reside within the world, within the confines of a future here in the world, but to in fact be partakers of a kingdom that is to come, to work towards that goal, to prepare our brothers and sisters for the same thing. Now in the middle of that, we can certainly make some differences. We can make those differences by conveying the attributes of a citizen of the kingdom here in this reality. Sadly, many people don't do that. They won't convey the mercy and the love that God gave to them, but they would rather point at other people. I'm talking about Christians, people who say they believe. They would rather point at the imperfections of those around them. In effect, they become fault finders. Those who have not become fault finders are slowly drifting into these strange doctrines, these doctrines of compromise, which is a very dangerous thing. And you know what? The Lord told us this. These things would happen. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, we can read all about it. In fact, he to told us to stay to sound doctrine because he knew what was written at that time about this latter generation. In fact, in chapter 4 of 1 Timothy, it spoke about some departing the faith in the latter times. But it says they would be giving heed to seducing spirits, doctrines of devils. What is that? What is a seducing spirit and doctrines of devils? Now, mind you, he's not talking about the world. He's talking about those of the faith. If we continue to read, it says, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. You know, when your conscience is seared, or sealed up. You know, seared is a pretty strong term, which means you you won't have a conscience regarding what, what you're telling other people or taking into yourself. It says they, were, they will be forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. We have people now and you're going to hear it more and more, who discuss the law, the laws of God. They discuss it. Soon enough, they will impose the fact that you can't eat certain meats because they will resurrect the law. And these will be people who, who are supposedly your brothers and sisters. Let's continue. For, it is, for if it is sanctified by the word of God, prayer, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith, and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained, where you have learned in the gospel of Jesus Christ. But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather ungodliness, for 
Bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God. Let me read that one more time. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. You know, a lot of people, their faith is being diluted with these strange doctrines. In other, in other words, they're picking and choosing what to believe in the Word of God, carrying that forward. For them, there's a cruel payment. They won't make it. The worst part is they're becoming delusional, thinking what they're saying is the truth. However, it's not the written scripture. And so now we live in a time very different than any other time. For the last few days, people heard about a comet passing overhead, but they forgot about it quickly. And you know what? I said it. BP said it. NASA also stated this. Air Force Command did a publication on it. There's something else behind this comet. Everybody forgot about it, therefore it's going to take people by surprise because they're not looking for it, nor are they prepared for it. I wanted people to watch the dust, watch people, animals, and the weather, because the dust will settle and it will begin to change things. People's immune systems will be compromised. Strange viruses will surface or sickness will begin to increase based on where that dust falls in that general vicinity. And this all is a prelude because during the end of this year, people are going to notice some radical changes in the atmosphere. It will, in effect, begin to build up in the atmosphere, and then some people will be frightful. But when they are frightful, when they're ready to receive truth, who among us will be calm enough, grounded enough to tell them what the truth is? Not by your own interpretation, but who among us can point to Scripture and give an individual Scriptures? in context exactly what jesus said sometimes when you're telling a scripture in this day and age it's not enough just to give one scripture you're going to have to learn to communicate plainly to the people when it comes to scripture not riddles not cryptic like i talk i talk cryptic sometimes because i have to they have to understand the simple truth a very simple truth because when the calamity does come like the late hurricanes and very impressive low pressure systems that will form the isobars that will take hold of america when these things begin to form we have to be ready to receive these folks a lot of people are going to begin to hit rock bottom with their finances for the life of me i don't know why anybody would buy the unemployment numbers just to give you an idea the unemployment numbers go down when a person can no longer draw unemployment so they're no longer counted that means they're out of the system but people actually believe the unemployment numbers are going down. They're painting a facade, so we can't go by the uh, statistics that they're giving. The fact Here's a fact, is that the unemployment rating is probably double, if not more, than what they're saying. Because a lot of people have quit looking for a job a long time ago, and they just drop them from the list. When they drop off the list, the unemployment numbers look better because they're no longer looking for a job. In fact, if you can't draw unemployment, you're not counted. That's what's been happening. But people are buying the lie as though magically those people found jobs. No, they didn't. They can no longer be counted because their unemployment ran out. So they're kicked out of the system. They're no longer counted. Things are getting worse, but they're painting a pretty picture all around it to ease you of the truth. And the truth is, this country is folding in on itself. It's like a Ponzi scheme that they couldn't maintain. We all know that Russia and China and Iran have been talking diligently, continuously, planning and plotting something. Now, what do you think they're plotting? Iran wants America destroyed. China wants to get something out of America before it's destroyed. And Putin is bold enough to coordinate the effort. You see, China has the know-how, Russia has the boldness, and Iran has an uncanny ability to coordinate things that you couldn't possibly understand. You see, it takes a ruthless individual to understand how ruthless these people can be. You have to be ruthless. And so you're not going to understand the full breadth and width of what they're capable of. You just simply won't do it. In fact, it'll catch you off guard of what they're trying to do. Many people in America underestimate what Iran can do because they, th they really don't think they are technologically advanced. 
That is a lie. America wants you to believe that we have weapons and we can take any enemy we want. That too is a lie. See, what a lot of people don't know is that while we have the technology to do so, most of the technology has been held up with congressional hearings and other things, and they've decided to split the military-industrial complex from the government. So now the military-industrial complex has no one to answer to but itself. It is, in fact, an entity of its own. It does not support America. So because it does not support America, they answer to no one. However, they do demand money from America, and America gives it. That's why we're missing, I believe it's $13 trillion. Just missing it. Don't know where it went, just missing it. Well, if you're not familiar with black budgets, you should find out about them, how real they are. That's where most of the money went. But aside from money, which we all know is going to fail anyway, or certainly get rough, and people are going to be forced to change from one monetary system to a different type of regulation system that does not involve money at all. In a world this advanced, where everyone is using computers, by the way, that was a goal. That was a goal made in the 1950s, to have everyone using a reporting system, an observation system, called a computer. That's what they're doing. Everything you do is by a computer. Every company is ran by a computer. All the books are stored on mainframes and or some type media. All the banks, their backup systems are by computer. So all the necessary items are in place. The only thing holding them back is that massive death has not taken place yet. It means one or two things. If a celestial happening does not take out a lot of people, then someone will start a war. That's as simple as that. You see, they don't think the way you do. They're not so uh, compassionate as you are. They realize that saving an idea is worth three quarters of the lives that live on planet Earth. That's what they think. They're saving their idea. You see, they know money is a facade. You know what gold and silver is good for these days? Manufacturing. That's what it's good for. Most of the gold and silver has been going into manufacturing anyway. It takes two or three tons of gold to make some of the high-tech devices that I may talk about one day. Two or three tons of gold to make some of those high-tech devices. That within itself can tell you right there. The gold and silver thing is not going to pan out. Folks, a book of Revelation. What an interesting book. We have been looking at the book of Revelation in the last time. I don't want to get too deep into it because everybody's not here today. So we're not going to get too deep into it. But there are some things that people are going to get confused about. I guarantee you they're going to get confused about. Now, again, I read this line by line. I read the scriptures line by line. And so sometimes you can throw one book into something and it's not quite, it didn't quite coordinate. Well, when that happens, you might be in the wrong time frame. But in the book of Revelation, it gives us a battle plan or an end times plan of all the, the events that will be taking place. Even uh, until the judgment, thousand year reign. We learned about that first time we read through it. I'm going to reiterate on that because certain people will rule and reign with Christ. The rest will sleep. There's going to be harvesters that come to earth. But what we're concentrating on now are the three woes that will happen. The three woes. The one woe was the fifth angel. Woe number two was the sixth angel. Woe number three was the seventh angel sounding. These are woes from the heavens, and they can't be good. We can take, for instance, when the first angel sounded, there was no woe, but all the green grass was burned up and the trees, one third of the trees were burned up. No woe in the second angel sounding, when a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and a third part of the sea became blood, a third part of the creatures in the sea that had life died, and a third part of the ships were destroyed. There was no woe on the third angel sounding, where a great star from having burning as it were lamp fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters and made them poison, and many men died from drinking those waters. There was no woe on the fourth angel sounding, when one third of the sun was smitten, and the moon also and a third part of the stars did not show. Which means, by the way, something was in the way of the moon, something was in the way of the sun, and something was in the way of the stars. Something big. There was no woe for that. But then the angel, a loud voice says, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices, of the trumpets, of the three angels, 
which are yet to sound. This first woe is not good. Now remember, during this time we have the 144,000 still on earth. So the fifth angel sounds, and a star fell from heaven unto earth, and to him was given a key to the bottomless pit. Did everybody pick up on that? A star fell from heaven to earth, and to him was given a key to the bottomless pit. So the star was in fact to him. You see, when it mentions stars falling to earth, I don't know if you've contemplated this or not. When it mentions stars falling to earth, normally, if it's a physical object, it will give a, what happened to the earth when it fell. It does not say that here because it was an individual. It was an individual. Here's the bad part about this. There's another place in here where stars fell to earth, but there was no reaction from the earth. It did not say what those stars did when they got to earth, but it did say they fell from heaven unto the earth. That same term again. In Revelation chapter 6, 13, it says, And the stars of heaven fell unto earth, even as a fig casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. This term, stars of heaven fell unto earth. We can find that again in chapter 9, when it says, I saw a star fall from heaven unto earth. Now, people may say, okay, well, you know, the other, the wormwood was like that. No, here's it. Here, here's wormwood and the great mountain were different. In Revelation 8, 8, it says, And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burned with fire was cast into the sea. Now, that's what it was. Here's the effect. A third part of the sea became blood, and a third part of the creatures, which were in the sea and had life died. Third part of the ships were destroyed. Second one, third angel sounds, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were lamp, and it fell upon a third part of the rivers. You see the pattern here? When a physical object falls to earth, it gives... The, uh, what it did, it gives a result of that object falling. Two places in Revelation, stars fell. They had no impact on earth except it was a hymn or a bunch of itch. Now, in Revelation 6, 12, if you look at that in the Greek, it can represent sons of God. Now, sons of God is referred to as an angel. Just to let you know that. You see, angels are God's direct creation. They have no mother or father. They are direct creation. That's why they're called sons of God. Given that premise, in Revelation 6, when a bunch of them fall to earth, that can't be good. That just can't be good. But sure enough, there are hints to this episode about things falling to earth. Now, can you imagine a bunch of angels falling to earth? Now, remember, this is at the beginning of the sixth seal. At the beginning. And I tried to explain to you guys that after the great tribulation, which is prior to to the sixth seal. It's not going to be very good to be here on earth. Not going to be very good. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. Now, if these stars are simply rocks, then why in the first angel do we have hail, fire mingled with blood cast upon the earth? And it gives their effect. You see, it gives an effect of a physical object. It gives no effect of angels falling to earth, except that they fell unto earth. That's a term, by the way. Something of heaven fell unto earth. That word fell is also significant as it was generalized from cast lost their position when it references a star it means lost their position so they were booted out of heaven straight to earth so if these are in fact fallen angels coming back to earth i'm gonna tell you right now i don't think anybody wants to be here given the premise that they're already here on earth they fell to earth you see by the way in matthew 24 after the tribes of the earth mourn they mourned because they could see the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. They could see that he was coming. When he comes, he comes with what? Is he coming alone? Or is he coming with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment on the earth? How is he coming? We're going to figure that out. I think in Revelation 6, 13 is telling us something here. You know, we did mention what a dimensional opening, what it would look like. It actually looks like a sideways mushroom cloud. Immediately after they fall to earth, the sky is rolled together as a scroll or departed as a scroll. Many people, and you know what? We have to refer to dreams because good people who have these dreams, who pray a lot and have them again, have them again, and have them again. It means something. I know a lot of people who have never discussed UFOs, talked about them or anything else, 
All of a sudden, they're having dreams of a countless number of UFOs coming to Earth. You guys think that's coincidence? And you know, we have to. We rely on the Word, but we also know that the Lord speaks to many in dreams. Why would people have such dreams? And in most cases, these UFOs are taking the souls of men, consuming them, hovering overhead, sky full of them. There are a few people I know who are nervous about this. Now, these are people who have clearances that cannot be mentioned. And a lot of your leaders in America know for a fact they're coming. You see, your leaders know for an absolute fact they're coming. I'm not going to spend too much time on it because I'm going to give you a secret. You can talk about anything you want to talk about over the phone. You can chat about it and everything else. But I'm going to give you something that when you start talking about UFOs, alien abductions, and alien life forms, your phone is tapped. I'm going to just let you know that. Your phone is instantly tapped. If you have a conversation about that, you're going to hear strange clicks and everything else on your phone. Any other subject you can talk about, but you begin to talk about that and you trigger the NSA systems to watch all of your conversations. All of your conversations. Now, what does that tell you? Keep it to yourself, but I'm just telling you a truth, a truth that you need to know. That is a serious matter because a great many of them are in the areas that you heard about only in rumors. Armies of them waiting. They're waiting for the return of something. And when the return happens, they all wake up, all of them. So I can submit to you this. If, you, if you're sitting there looking at Revelation and you think it's going to be conventional in the confines of what you're used to, you're sadly mistaken. You guys know I have been saying consistently over and over again, don't play with your salvation. Don't joke around with your salvation. You see, every single person needs to begin to define order in their lives. I'll tell you something psychologically I've found. If you keep your house in a mess, your thoughts are messy. In other words, you're thinking about everything out of order. You're normally one of those people who you, you have a hot temper or you'll get severely depressed in a matter of seconds. Why? Because you've lost control of your surroundings. Your surroundings are your conveyance of what's going on in your head. We tell soldiers back in the day, we used to tell them if you cut your hair like a soldier, you'll feel like a soldier. And that's true for the most part. Because when you cut your hair like a soldier with a high and tight, you have no choice but to allow yourself to be accepted by the ranks. It's a reminder of who you belong to. But when you grow your hair out, all these young soldiers want to do is go out and impress somebody else outside of those in uniform. You cut your hair high and tight, you automatically know you can't go out to the world and impress these other people because your hair is jacked up. You got a high and tight. So you have to stay within the ranks and be accepted, where it's no big deal. And believe me, some high and tights, they don't look good. I mean, they're high and tights, but some people have funny shaped heads. They don't wear them quite right. That's just the way it is. We as Christians need to organize our thoughts, our surroundings, our camps must be clean. Because if our camps are not clean, that means something in us is unclean. Here, here's a deal. If you're striving for God's order, you can't help yourself but to put everything else in order. Now, I didn't say be a control individual, one of those control individuals that they bug themselves to pieces because someone moves something out of place. I'm not talking about those people. If your kids go through the house and they're moving stuff out of place, you know what you need to do? First of all, you have to realize children grow, children grow, and they're not yours. You're just a caretaker. You're put in charge over those children until they reach a certain age, but they belong to the father, not you. You gave life to them, but their soul comes from the father. So they're not yours, but you should train them up in the way they should go, not fuss them in the way they should go. They have to navigate this world. Use discipline. Never use discipline when you're angry. That doesn't work out too well. If you're angry, don't ever discipline your child. You need to learn to discipline your child when you're absent. Here's the problem with most people. And I don't mean to get into a, a little lesson here, but uh, most people get angry and then they discipline their child because when they're not angry, they look over everything they do. You shouldn't be like that. Don't look over things they do. Look at what they're doing. Understand that they have to make it in a world that's worse than what we had and train them up in the way they should go. Oh, your child will love you for that. Some children resent their parents simply because they get angry and then they correct them out of anger. And the child can understand that you're correcting them out of anger. 
And whatever you do does not come out right because you're angry. And that's why most parents go back to, oh, I was too hard on you. So just don't do it when you're angry. Do it when you're feeling good, when you're feeling okay. Don't do it when you're angry. First of all, if you've gotten angry, you lost control. Why would you correct your child when you just lost control? Go get your control back. Look at the situation and train the child up. That works a lot better for the child. You're not trying to make it better for you. When you have a child, guess what? That's your that's your job right there. You can bring glory to the Father through the raising of your children. You most certainly can. That's written in the Bible too. Anyway, not going to go down that road. When I correct people and discipline them, never am I angry. I'm always sober when I do that because I know that's when things count. You have their full attention when you're given correction, and it needs to be done in or it needs to be done in orderly fashion with structure. Discipline must have structure. You can't be a raving lunatic when you correct your children. They will resent you for it. It puts distance between you and the child. Then they won't share things with you. Then if something is wrong, they'll hold it in because they have a fear that you're going to lose control. So just simply don't lose control. Be approachable to your children. These are not the days where you want to put distance between you and your child. But in Revelation, we have stars falling. Now, no, tons of people will dispute me on this and say, well, they're not, you know, stars are not fallen angels. Hmm, that's strange. Didn't it say it's all Satan fall like a star to earth? Now, let me give you uh, just a small piece of advice. Some of these fallen angels, you see, when an angel falls, he's stripped of his ability to go back to the throne. They fell. They're stripped of certain abilities. So they have to rely on manipulation and technology with raw materials. Why do you think the 200 that fell on Mount Hermon never went back? Well, it's because they couldn't. What did they teach man? They taught men war. They taught men technology and everything else. That's what they taught men. They taught women how to put, put on makeup and seduce people. They absolutely did. They taught women and men how to give abortions. They absolutely did. They taught these things. They taught them. And you see, men, humans, we come along not knowing the full truth of the past. And we take pride in certain things that we do that were taught by fallen angels, don't we? How can we take pride in something the Lord says no, no about? Hmm. So what has happened again is that, again, they've taught men technology, how to do things in the medical field, the wrong things. See, they do genetic tampering and everything else. And we picked up those things. We've employed them and we've mastered them. We've mastered them. Yet they're still teaching us how to make more powerful weapons, much more powerful weapons. They have continent killers now that they absolutely know will work because they made small versions, had very good results. God forbid they ever make a the full size one. They do things like that. Just about everything you can imagine exists somewhere here on Earth. Laser weapons, that's quite common. You see the transition we're making, and it's no big deal to anyone. We have autonomous drones. So you guys know what autonomy is? An autonomous drone is a drone that can operate all by itself. We have autonomous tractor trailers and vehicles. We have autonomous phone systems. Most of you folks call on a phone system you think you're entertaining a live person but you're not you're talking to a computer loaded with artificial intelligence some of you pass tractor trailers on the road with tenant windows there's no driver in the seat many people think they need some sort of guidance system in the highways for those trucks to work wrong it's absolutely wrong you see in um, 1995 and then in 2000 they perfected the technology you think soldiers are going to fire bullets? Not when they're given the new issue. They can effectively train a soldier with the new weapons that we have in three days. And most of the training is the various things they can recharge them from. The weapons get energy from motion. Anyway, enough on that. They have kinetic rounds that'll travel all the way around the earth. But now we have autonomous vehicles in the air. That means they carry out their orders. That's what that means. And it's up to that vehicle to decide what's best to do in any given situation to accomplish the mission. You think there's someone back in the background flying these things. You're wrong. They're not flying them. They give the autonomous aerial vehicle an objective, and the objective is met. Any way it can make it happen. Some of these autonomous aircraft 
have robots in them. They've already perfected the autonomous um, insect size, but you see they're all receiving information from a system that you couldn't possibly conceive. There are three core systems on this planet. All three of them work together because they draw a lot of energy from the inside of the earth. They're powered by heat, ironically. They're feeding all these other defense computers information. It is rumored that two of these systems have reached a type of consciousness, which means now it's developing some moral values. The computer is mixed with brain tissue, so it is a thinking, growing computer. Most movements, political movements and so forth, are dictated by these systems based off trending. Leaders are not making decisions anymore. They're being advised from computer systems. Thus, they want everybody to have some type of handheld device and or PC so the reporting system can be more accurate. They can already see you in a 3D environment and because they're sending signals out, which are like sonar, which map 3,000 feet around the individual based on sound. And the sound does supersede those sounds that you hear with the human ear. Part of it is in the, um, it's about the 4.3 gigahertz range and higher. So we've really gone beyond a point that is comprehensible. We've really gone beyond that point. Now with the development of nano factories, nanotechnology has been in production for the last seven years. Nanotechnology, molecule sized devices. They work very efficiently because we perfected the beam of the laser. Now they have a laser down to a particle size that's impossible to see with the human eye, yet you can mold, cut, silicone, silver, and gold to make these small nano devices. Some of that is called smart dust, which is all over the place. Anybody ever heard of smart dust? There was an actual rumor about smart dust four years ago. Somehow it got out to the public, uh, into the public's eye. But they were wrong about what it actually was. But it's all over the place. You breathe it in and out every single day. Smart dust is everywhere. Thank God we have Jesus. We're not going to keep these bodies. There's a new vessel waiting on us. Thank God for that. But to actually know your whereabouts, no problem. But here's, here's the deal. Revelation is unfolding. Now, none of us have the true timing as to how long it's going to take. We can only watch and speculate as the time gets closer. But we know that there are celestial happenings this year, very heavy next year. Next year is so unsure, I'm telling you now, next year could be just a simple disaster. So we just don't know. But we'll certainly know once we see certain signs. Because the Lord said, I'll not have you ignorant concerning the devices of the enemy. He also said that if we watch, we'll know. So we, at, at some given point in time, those of us who don't fall away, we will reach or have that collective knowledge from God, revelation from God, not through a book, but from God, as to the timing, he'll do it. He does that sometimes, and it's, it's, it feels as if something has touched your soul. I've had that many times. Something would nudge me very hard to move left, to get down, to get out of the area, and so forth and so on, during those times I served in combat, all the time. And I began to listen to them, and then look back and marvel, saying, oh, if I would have stayed there, I would have been dead. But it's that small little voice. But when it's telling you something, it can speak very loudly. But the trick is you have to have your ears open. Most of us are so preoccupied with other things, we can't even hear anything other than what we want. That's what can get in your way. When you're constantly thinking about what you want, you can't hear the Lord's voice. You drown it out. You'll speak louder than his voice in your head until you slow yourself down. So we know certain things are coming, but these stars, they're absolutely preparing for. Now, I'm not saying an alien invasion because it's not going to happen like that. People think crafts are going to start, uh, you know, coming in and shooting up things. No. Never once in Revelation did it say they came to destroy the earth. It's not what it said. And even those angels who had power to hurt the earth were told not to hurt anything until they seal the servants of God in their forehead. See how that works? So they will come. But prior to that time, a great many people are going to be gone. You know, if a great many people are gone before that time, because they came out of great tribulation, here's, here's something. Will you, in fact, be able to recognize the great tribulation? I submit to you this. Because we live in the world, we are conditioned to the time we live in. 
Now, to a person in the past, if somebody from 100 years ago woke up right now, they would say, oh, this is the Great Tribulation, simply because of how things are operating. They wouldn't be able to accept it. They'd look at the news and it would be a disaster. They would find out about all the wars and things going on. It'd be a disaster. To us, we've been conditioned to it. We have been conditioned. And so to us, it's just part of life. But to someone who has never seen it before, it would be horrific. It would be spiritually horrific. Horrific the way the countries have joined to one another, knowing their potential. It would be horrific. But we've been conditioned. How do we know we have not just stepped into that time? The fight, ladies and gentlemen, is for your soul. And I'm telling you now, we have reached a point in time. Things are very unclear. Because we have the internet and people can read anything they want, many, many, many people are falling away from the faith right now. They're falling away, falling away from the faith. In other words, they say they believe in Jesus, but you know what? Most of their time is spent with other things. They're hunting and searching for the interesting things. They've given ear to things that tickle their ears, doctrines of devils and demons. That's what they've done. In the time of Noah, I can only imagine the rain falling, them not seeing rain, and then being conditioned to the rain, going to higher ground, still doing what they're doing. The only time they absolutely cried in pain was when they found out the water was over their heads and the dams burst and the great the water was released out of the earth and took them over. I'm almost confident they saw it sprinkled and they pondered and wondered for a few minutes and then they were accustomed to it. They put shelters over their heads. They moved to higher ground. No one knew the rain wouldn't stop, but they didn't. What about now? Things are multiplying now. Pressures are getting to people now, making them fall away from the faith. They're falling away from the faith. People are toying with Christianity. They think nothing is wrong with it. In fact, they've been desensitized to Jesus and God himself. They mock him every single day. But you see, we've been conditioned. We've been conditioned. That's why we have to watch. That's why Jesus told this generation to watch. Because if you're in the middle of something, it's hard to determine what it is. It's very hard to determine. That would be like you standing in the desert at night and trying to figure out if you're in a valley or not. Well, if you're standing in the desert at night with no moonlight, you're not going to determine if you're in a valley without proper equipment or, or somebody coming and telling you this, that, and the other without a compass or without uh, uh, certain night vision equipment. There's no way you can tell. And you know what? The world is in darkness right now. People are looking for things to get chaotic. I'm telling you, they are chaotic. You're standing in the middle of something. God's people come out of great tribulation because the Lord promised something. He promised and he said he'll never place you in a position beyond that which you can bear. God cannot lie. He knows that in the great tribulation, it would be a tumultuous time and it would consume us if we stayed. Some of us who are sensitive to the spirit can feel that tumultuous darkness, but a great many people can't see it. And do you know why they can't see it? because they're given false opportunities. They're given a false comfort in the world. And when people have false opportunities and false comforts, guess what? They choose the opportunity and the comfort at the time. They'll instantly say, well, what you're talking about is far off. That's what they'll say. But if you have no comfort and if you have no opportunity, you really begin to watch and you really begin to contemplate, Lord, we're getting closer. You see, the only way you can actually see is to take your comfort away. That's the only way to make you watch. If you have your comfort back, you won't watch. You won't watch it. You'll watch TV, but you certainly won't watch what's going on around the world until you're conditioned by the Lord to handle your substance, which is to use it on the behalf of another person. This week, I've heard everything. I've heard strike orders. The defense net has been up for a long time. Fuel orders have been delivered. You know, before they do a fuel order, no war can start. After the fuel has been delivered, a war can start. Are you guys aware of that? They're getting ready to make a move because they know that they cannot allow Russia, China, and Iran to continue doing what they're doing. They know the price. They know what's going to happen. And we know by reading Isaiah 34 that there will be a great war. We know this. We shouldn't be blind to that factor. Everything around you is telling you, even internally, it's telling you something beyond what you imagined is about to take place. Everything within you is telling you, get ready for the return of Jesus Christ. Everything within you is warning you 
don't go to sleep or get comfortable now. This is when people begin to strive and fight. They begin to strive and fight. But I tell you this, without God's structure, you, you'll suffer through that striving. And what we need is God's structure back. We can establish that. It'll only take a few days to do it. But to actually ask him, Lord, in this situation, what do you require of me? I ask the Lord things like that all the time. What is it that you require of me in this hour that we're in? And he shows me, and I do it, and more revelation comes. See, I don't have time to think of myself, but I am thinking of you. And because I do think of you, the Lord allows me to communicate to you so you understand it. If you didn't understand me, you probably should go to another person. But to some of you, the Lord allows you to hear me. Hear the simplistic truth coming right out of Scripture. Now, some of the things I say is from observation, a state of affairs of the world. But when you get into the scriptures, you find they're not that difficult after all. They're full of life, full of truth. And above all things, the Lord wants us to make it. You have to keep that in your head. He doesn't want us to fail. He wants us to make it. Everything he inspired to write in this Bible was to get you back home, to teach you the conduct of a citizen in the kingdom so that you could also not only identify other citizens of the kingdom, but to overcome Satan in the process of your walk. Because you have to overcome Satan in this walk. You have to know what the enemy is capable of. You have to know who Satan is, how he works. All throughout this Bible, we can see two immutable things. God loves us, and we can see all the devices of Satan, because he does the same thing over and over again. Every time he works, he uses the same methods to bring a Christian down. Unfortunately, some people fall for it. They fall for it because they lose hope and faith in the Bible because of their own impatience. They won't have patience. Normally, people don't have patience because their patience has not been exercised. We who read the Bible understand that patience is exercised. Faith is exercised or stretched when you're in your trials and tribulations. That's when it's exercised. But a great many of us have spent many years wheezing out of our tribulations and trials instead of learning and exercising our patience and faith because the fact is we never felt secure within God 100%. Here's what feeling secure is. If you're outside on the ground and a thunderstorm is coming, would you go to sleep? You had no shelter overhead or anything. You're out in the middle of nowhere and a thunderstorm is coming. Would you go to sleep? The answer is no, you wouldn't. You would try desperately to find some type of shelter. Then when the mud started coming up, you certainly couldn't go to sleep. Right? So you have no security out there. Here's what happens in a house. You hear of a thunderstorm coming, and you get in your bed, and there's no leaks, and you go to sleep. But you see, we got to be that same way with the Lord. When a trial comes for me, I know that the Lord is covering me. So guess what? I can, in fact, glory in tribulation because I know he's with me. But if you, don't, if you doubt him in any way, and you're going through a storm of life, you do the same thing the disciples did. And Jesus was right there. They were terrified. Jesus was sleeping. They were terrified because they had no trust. They had no trust in him. You know, you can rest in him. You can rest in the fact that he is God. You can rest in him. You can actually rest in him. How many of us do that? How many of us can absolutely say, if God was looking right at us, and we knew we would be cast into outer darkness if we lied to his face, how many of us can really say, I can trust in God. Because you see, to trust in God is to not be upset. To trust in God is to have absolute security in your trials and tribulations. To trust in God is to know that he's in control of all things. We can rest. We can rest in him, but we have to know that he is God first. It's just like you sleeping in the desert with no protection and you sleeping in a house with sufficient protection. It's a very steep contrast. How many of us can actually say, I've trusted in you, God. I'll, I'll tell you the truth. I'm careful when situations arise. I'm careful to remember that, to say, I'll trust in you, Lord. And guess what? I don't get those. You don't get those butterflies in your stomach anymore. See, your body will tell you the truth. We can tell things all we want, but internally when your heart rate goes up, and you got the, you know, that sick feeling in your stomach. Well, you can't deceive your body when you're really worried. You can't do it. You cannot deceive your body. But when you have absolute confidence in the Father, you have something different happens. 
you begin to feel a little joy. Number one, because he said they were coming. And by the way, this would sound crazy to a person of the world. But number one, you know those trials and tribulations are coming. You know he's going to get you out of it. But most importantly, you know it came for very specific reasons. It does try your faith and increases it. And it gives you a multitude of knowledge. But most importantly, for every trial and tribulation you have, he's right there with you in it. You see, you've never gone through anything alone. You've never gone through anything alone. He's always been there. But you see, we have to trust him. We have to actually trust him. Once we trust him, it doesn't matter what comes. We can still rest in him. Like Jesus did on that ship in the middle of a storm on high seas. We can rest in him. You know, I'm convinced nothing can happen to me until the Lord says, okay. Therefore, I do not worry about my own safety. I don't worry about my own safety. I'm compassionate to my brothers and sisters because when one is in a bad mood, I'll sit quiet with them. If they ask me for help, I want to be available. If they need to talk, I need to be approachable. If they're looking for Jesus, I need to know what scriptures to give them. See, I have to be ready in season and out of season. There's no way I can be ready if I'm tormented by a type of fear that normally comes when you don't trust God. It's as simple as that. Either we trust him or we don't. There's no middle gray area in between that. This is why I say we have to get our own houses in order and do it quickly. And the number one thing is you need to ask yourself for real. Not just to simply say it because of etiquette or say it just to say it to be in with everybody else. But ask yourself, do I really trust God? But we have our houses to put in order quickly. When he comes, we need to be in position. There's no way we can stand if we don't trust him. And some of us have spent a lifetime perfecting worry. And you know what? Look back on your life. Look at how much time worry has just eaten off your life. Worry is like a cancer. Look at how much time we've invested in worry, not knowing in all these other things, when all we had to do was trust in our God. You see, because we're all here, we're all here. Some of us could have been in better conditions here and some people right now, because the spirit is, yes, he's telling on you. Some people say the only reason I'm here is because I had to do something bad because that's the way I got out. You could have stood taller at the end, having stood still and not doing anything and let God fully deliver you than doing it yourself. Because see, what you did was cause yourself wounds. You're still here, yes, because God wanted you here, but you're scraped up and scarred. If we do it the Lord's way, we come out whole, clean, and better. We come out much more than what we were when we went in. We trust him much more. That's the most important thing. You see, trust problems with the Father is because we never let the Father show us he is the Father. All this time, he's been telling you, I am your Father in heaven. He's been wanting to demonstrate how he is your Father in heaven. But we fought him tooth and nail because we didn't trust and we had to get out of our own trials and tribulations no more we can have rest in him you can have all security and peace in him but we have to realize his words are true we're the ones that are wrong his words are true we have to trust him you know what's going to come I, 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 a time is coming when you will witness the unbelievable are you going to be one of those ones that says well i think the lord will protect me i'm not sure are you made one of those ones because here's a fact if you're doing it right now, you're going to do it there too. See, if you can't trust God all the way right now, this time, right now, you're not going to trust him in the future. Where you are right now counts. We have to give it 100%. Having all we could do by his word, he will certainly hold us and shield us, appoint his guardian angels over us at that given time. You see, fear comes. Fear is a direct result of not trusting God, period. That's where fear comes from. You know what ch a child, when a child is held real tight, they don't have fear. But if you put them down, instant fear. Have you guys ever seen that? You put a child down, there's a lot of people around. They're not comfortable with everybody in the room. And you put them down on the ground and they frantically reach out for you because they don't want to go down. They don't know everybody yet. You pick them back up and you hold them. They hold you tight. They don't want you to let go. After a while, if you do that, they're calm again, so long as you hold them. Some of us have that same fear because we simply don't believe God is right there with us. We don't trust that he's going to hold us like that when it counts. Let's be honest. We don't. 
And so we too, we, we panic just like that. We panic just like that. When problems come, we panic. But you know what? A child is confident that if any danger comes, knows his parent will grab him up and embrace him. Well, that child begins to explore. Those are the children you have to chase because they've known you picked them up so long that they have full confidence that if anything happens, you're going to get them. And so you end up chasing them. Those are the children that like to wander off. When you do trust him, then you know, in fact, he does love you and he's right there with you. He will embrace you. That's why it was written, perfect love casts out all fear. That's a confusing scripture to a lot of people. But liken that to what I just told you about the babies, and you'll see why. So we have to trust him. As adults, we're tested in those trials. Our trust is tested in the trial. You see, when nothing is happening, it's easy to say, oh, yeah, I trust God. But when everything goes wrong, do you still say that in truth? Or do you sit up at nights worrying? I mean, just so worried you can't sleep, you can't eat. You see, that's not trusting God. He's been trying to show you he'll deliver you in all your situations. Because a time is coming when men will not worry about money. They won't even worry about food. They won't worry about clothing or shelter. They're going to worry about what they're seeing with their own eyes in front of them. They're going to want protection from them, knowing that no human being can protect them from what they see. And the only security they're ever going to have is death. But in those days, it was written, men will seek death, but will not find it. You see, those people didn't have God. They didn't trust God. That's why they were around when Abaddon opened the bottomless pit. Those people will seek death. That's the only security they're going to be able to have. The Lord and Joel said it would be this way. You run out of trouble, it's outside, things are after you and so forth. You put your hand on the wall and you're bitten by a snake. In other words, there's no escape. That's why men will seek death and won't find it. And they won't be able to die because there's nothing protecting them. Grace and mercy are lifted. Folks, we got to prepare our houses. Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved if you're not willing to repent? And the Lord Jesus Christ said, Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.